Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support also helps us to continue to share this message of grace, peace, and Christ's righteousness in the finished work of the cross. You can give online at cokerministries.com or you can mail your support to or prayer requests to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parker's Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Remember, if you are in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed. Thank you for coming, and um, um, thank Curtis and Joy for coming all the way from Pel- or, uh, Fergus Fall, or uh, <laughs> Parker's Prairie, Parker's Prairie, Pel- Parker's Pel- Prairie. Rapids, Parker's Pel- Prairie. Rapids this morning. <laughs> yeah, but we, last month we were going to have them out and do the Christmas talk, it's what, what I advertised on the email to all you guys, but weather came in, we couldn't do it, so I asked them to do it. In January, so they're going to do the Christmas. <laughs> We're preparing for next. Yeah, but it's a bigger than the Christmas thing. Thank it's you. not just Christmas, Christmas card thing. This is a big thing, and it's got big, big, giant ramifications, and and it's really good stuff. It so, is. So um, we just wanted to, I just wanted to make sure everybody got to see that because it's really, really interesting, contextual stuff. You know, <laughs> that you don't hear everywhere. <laughs> And then out there when you're leaving, there was a bowl for um, uh, to pay these guys because they drive two hours, it's below zero. They need more than gas money, you know. We need to help them out here, so take care of them. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to gather together in this your place, the place of our heart. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. Do what only you can do. Open the eyes of our understanding. Bring to us a spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of your role in our life, what Jesus has done to fulfill the eternal plan for man that was established before the foundations of the world. Father, I just bless this ministry. I bless this church. Uh, Thank you. Bless them with your spirit. Every meeting. Bless the ministries that go out from this place to touch this area for your glory. We thank you for their faithfulness to your kingdom. All God's people said, Amen Amen and amen. Um, Real simply, have you ever... uh, can, can you imagine, I don't think anybody's ever done it, can you imagine having 50 rabbits in a box, oh, maybe about this big, with a lid on it, no bottom, and they're inside the box. These are wild rabbits. And at one time, you pull up the box like this, and rabbits go which direction? Everywhere. Everywhere. Every direction. They don't follow one another. They go everywhere. Well, that's what we're going to do tonight. (laughs) Rabbit trails. I mean, you can't get it. We're we're going to start in the book of Genesis. And the book of Genesis is like a box of 50 rabbits. And you can hardly even open up the pages without getting a rabbit trail going some other direction. And we're not going to take all those rabbit trails. Um, we're, We're going to stay on the one we're with. But we could, you know, we can't. It's so fun. The Word of God is just so fun. And uh, I believe that you believe it's that way too, or you wouldn't be here on a Saturday. Uh, 
Is this a Saturday? Yeah. Mm -hmm. On a Saturday. And um, so I, I just so excited that you're here. Uh, we're going to be sharing something that that uh, is not misunderstood. It's just not understood. And um, the problem is in America, we divide everything up as a story. You ever heard of the nativity story? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not a story. Anybody heard of uh, Little Bo Peep? Mm -hmm. That's a story. See? You ever heard of the Christmas story? Mm -hmm. That's not a story. This is the greatest story. It's made up of multiple books, multiple authors, and it's telling one thing. There's lots of things in it, many chapters. It's a story that begins in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. And, you know, we can even go, we can actually go before the world was even be. When, well, let me show you how that works. Uh, Jesus, what happened to Jesus at Calvary? He was what? Say crucified at Calvary, right? Yep. When was he slain? Before the foundations of the world. Before the foundations of the world. So what does that mean? That means in God, it was already done. Before it happened on earth, it was finished. In other words, God doesn't do something on earth that he already hasn't finished in himself. Wow. Well, some of that teaching is on that little little card thing that we need to understand that 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 the very beginning Isaiah forty six ten we taught this several months ago here uh, it, it declares that God has declared the end from the what beginning. the beginning yeah. that in the very beginning of time God declared the end and the way it was going to happen now either the word of God is true people or it's not. We don't have options to pick and choose. So in the beginning, God declared, how does that say? Declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasures. Man, declaring the end from the beginning. So we're going to go back in the beginning and see... Really, uh, when you understand Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, Joy's going to put the New King James on the board as we do this. And uh, I still want someone to come up with a, a, an app, application for the computer that we can put on the sound system that when I give a verse, and since no one brings the Bibles anymore hardly, I, some people do. I said some. You couldn't even talk last time. <laughs> Uh, it sounds like pages turning. I miss the pages turning. Everybody's got their yeah, little pressing buttons. It just <laughs> give a verse and have the app just turning pages, you know. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, really, uh, I, I've got the little note in my Bible that says Christmas is coming. And uh, yes, we're going to be talking about what Americans understand as the Christmas story or the nativity. And my goal is not to absolutely destroy your traditions, but it's to give you the truth about what the Word says about this chapter in the greatest story ever told. And um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the promise. This is a prophetic promise of the coming of the Messiah. Now, some people say, well, that doesn't say that. Well, it's a, when it comes to the prophetic word in Scripture, how many people understand the prophetic word in Scripture? Raise your hand. Let me show. You need to understand the further away you are from the event, the less information there is. The closer to the event, the more information there is. You'll have a prophecy that starts it, and over a period of time, you'll start having other prophecies that confirm that first one and add to it. So in other words, God, not, God's not getting quieter. He's getting louder. Yeah. I've heard people say, well, God doesn't do this anymore today and God doesn't do that anymore today. There, there's a Latin word I want to share with you. <laughs> if you haven't heard this Latin word, when you hear someone say that God doesn't do that anymore today, that Latin word, there's a Latin word that ex it describes that. And it goes, does anybody know Latin? Well, you do now. That, that Latin word is bulimus craptimus. 
Okay? And uh, it describes that type of understanding. Because God is getting louder, not quieter. The scripture says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let's exalt his name together. Not make him quieter, smaller, less powerful. I believe with all my heart, the closer to the, the worse the world gets, the louder and greater God's going to show himself. Amen. Amen. Revival always comes in the darkest hours. And that's when he shows up. Amen. Amen. And you got to remember, too, I'm just going to throw this out there. And I'm a nugget guy. I'm a Bible nerd and I love nuggets. God didn't say in the morning and the evening was the first day. He said in the evening and the morning. God starts when it starts getting dark. God's day starts. Jewish day starts when? In the evening. When it starts getting dark, God starts moving. Matter of fact, <laughs> this has nothing to do with what we're teaching tonight. A lot of stuff I say doesn't, but... But you need to understand, go, go, go back in scripture and find out. We got a teaching called at midnight. Find out all the things that happened in scripture at midnight. The jail cell for Paul was opened at midnight. Guess when they crossed the Red Sea? It didn't happen in the daytime like what the movie said. It happened at the second watch. You know when the second watch is? Midnight. Oh, yeah. Grace was talking about the stones. What was written engraved on stones? Say the law. There's only one thing written engraved on stones, people. What was rolled away from the tomb so life could come forth? The stone. Maybe the law has to be rolled away from our heart. So life can come forth yeah. and freedom. Yeah. The scripture says, what father will give his son a stone, stone when he asks for bread? Yeah. What father's going to pay for regulations when he asks for life? Yeah. What was the first temptation of Jesus Christ? Turn, Turn these stones. stones. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Maybe Jesus was trying to tell us it's not about the law. Maybe Jesus answered it when he said, man's not going to live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds of the mouth of God. Wow. Maybe our life isn't going to be based on performance-based Christianity, but on what God says about us. You can go throughout Scripture and see that same pattern about stones. Jesus knelt down in the temple and wrote, his, wrote in the... It says the dirt, but you know there's no dirt in the temple. Never has been, never will be. Why did you say that? Our translators got it wrong. You know what the temple floor is made out of? <laughs> Cobblestone. Yeah. What wrote in the first set of stones? The finger of God. Maybe Jesus knelt down and with the same finger that wrote the Ten Commandments, they were quoting the law of Moses and maybe he was writing them. Just maybe. In the new covenant, the scripture says Jesus is our corner. <laughs> How many people baptized? Huh? We are lively. Oh, based on a cornerstone. Notice we're not baptized into Moses. The Jews were. We're not. We're baptized into Christ. We're different. We're special. We're just not like the Jews. We're family. They were servants. You understand that? They were under the law. If you're under the law, you're a servant. Oh, but if you're free from the law and born from above, you're a king's kid. See, Jesus had a title. His first title was the only begotten son of his title changed. You realize he's not the only begotten son of God anymore. He's the first of many brethren. Oh, oh yeah. So we're going to get into this. We're going to get into what I, we, to some of the culture I was sharing at the table earlier. When you have context 
and you take the text out of context, what are you left with? A con. And usually, if you don't understand the culture, the climate, the language, the mindset of the stories that are in Scripture, and you see, see what we've done in America, and I'm just as guilty as everybody else. I went to Bible school, learned, I learned from their mistakes. I'm not saying all Bible schools make mistakes. You know, there's basic information that's all good. But if you don't know the culture, the context, the language, the way, see, language is not just, at the Tower of Babel, God divided up the language and the speech. Both words are used. Why is both words used? Because there's a difference between speech and language. Language is a way of thinking. Yeah. Making you think now, isn't it? And that's our job. Joy in our job in, in ministry is not to convince you, listen, I, my goal tonight is not to make you think what I know I'm, that, I'm, that I know what I'm talking about and you're supposed to believe it. <laughs> I got out of that circle. My job is to challenge what you know. And I will do that. Those that have been around our ministry say amen. amen. I will say some stuff that you'll go, huh? If, if on Wednesday you're still thinking about this, Okay? All right, let's get into this. Luke chapter 2. There's some of the things we're going to make reference to, and they're called Targums. Has anybody ever heard the word Targums before? No. Uh, a lot of the information we're going to glean from comes out of what is known as the Mishnah, the Talmud, uh, and historical writings called Targums. They're more than historical writings. These are actually, Targums are Aramaic commentary of Scripture. And what I mean by Aramaic commentaries of Scripture is the Bible people that has commentaries from the time period that they were written. Do you realize that he... Which was before Christ. This way, yeah. That throughout... The Bible has been interpreted into... Translated in many languages. Aramaic was the way of understanding. And the, Aramaic and Hebrew are sister languages. You've ever, you've ever heard of Aramaic? It's like, well, that was written in Aramaic. And you go, well, what's that mean? Well, they're sister languages. Aramaic was the language. There's so much we can get. Do you realize Hebrew wasn't spoke for 2000 in our, you know, in our, from, let's say, 80, 70, for almost 2000 years, Hebrew wasn't spoken, wasn't a spoken language? Until the late, late, late 1800s. It wasn't spoken. It was studied, but it wasn't spoken. There's a guy named uh, Eliezer ben Yehuda that was born in 1853 or something like that. And his family was the first Jewish family to only speak Hebrew in their family. And because of his efforts, then they began to speak Hebrew, the first elementary school to speak Hebrew in elementary school to the children was in 1889. That's not too long ago. He died in 1922. That's pretty much, I mean, it wasn't spoken. They were slaves all over the world. They spoke German. They spoke French. They spoke whatever country they were in. When you're sold into slavery, you have to adopt. You have to assimilate your thinking into the country you're living in. Unlike what we've done to Scripture. We've taken the Word of God, assimilated, we've changed it to fit our thinking. Instead of us, change our thinking into the Word of God's thinking. And that's where we screw things up. Does everybody understand that? We have to see Scripture the way it was written with the understanding that was written in to the people it was written to. And so when I mention a Targum, a Targum is the Aramaic translation of Scripture that the Jews read. This is what the Jews read. They read Aramaic. They had commentary to go along. And so I'm going to mention several places as we go along. This, I'm going to read the scripture, but then I'm going to read the scripture in Aramaic. I'm not going to say the Aramaic words. I'm not smart. I cheat. I use other people to say that, okay? And then I'm going to tell you the commentary. Because when the Bible just alludes to something, they literally say the word Messiah. When they use the word king... When we use the word king, they use the word Messiah. 
So when we're looking at prophecy about the coming of the Messiah, in scripture, it may just say the word king. They use the word Messiah. They knew the Messiah was coming. Okay? So you need to understand that. So in, in Luke chapter 2, Let's start with verse one, uh, chapter 1. Chapter 1? Chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Now, there are so many things in here that we can talk about that are clues about what we're going to talk about. But we need to understand we don't have that kind of time today. For instance, virgin. Why, why would God need a virgin? First of all, it was prophetically spoken we, in Scripture that the Messiah, the, the king, the king Messiah was going to come through a virgin and doesn't name her, but that is going to be part of the, king of, uh, the lineage of David. Now, why would God need a virgin? Now, this is not Sunday morning. You can speak. Okay, wait, it's a... You know, why would God, God wanted somebody who never had done what he needed to be done. He wanted someone with no experience. So in your life, you need to understand when God calls you to do something that is way beyond you, or in your heart, you feel there's something way beyond you that you've never done before. And you might say, well, is that God? I can answer that. Yes. God, God is looking for people that have never done anything that will trust him to do what he's called them to do. Because he wants it done his way, not your way. Man cannot get the credit for this. Matter of fact, the conception, the birth of Jesus was not the miracle. It's the conception. Now what I need to make perfectly clear in this is this story that we're going to read or this passage of scripture needs to be you every day. This is the, this is the Christian life that we should be living today. You should be so willing and open Matter of fact, let's just talk about this. Let's go ahead. To a virgin, verse 27, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having, now, when I pause, and you can read up here what the name of the word is, everybody can give a big old gusto and say the word, okay? Let's try that one more time. Uh, and the virgin's name was? Mary. See, that way I know you're awake, okay? And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice! Rejoice. Rejoice. Highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But look here. I challenge people all the time. Did he hear her? I mean, did she hear him? Read what it says. But when she saw her, not heard when she saw him. Here an angel shows up and he's saying these great words and she's focused on what she sees. And that sounds like us in church. Well, that's not normal. It doesn't matter what's being said from, the, from whomever's doing the saying. Well, I'm not used to that. Well, that's not normal. Is that, what, is that what's happening here? Yeah. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are among, among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled about his saying. That is the way it was presented. How I mean, this was not normal. And considered what manner of greeting this was. She wasn't considering that she was blessed and highly favored. What happened in her heart? Well, it doesn't take a theologian to figure out that fear came into her heart. How come we know fear came into her heart? The angel said to her, do not be afraid. <laughs> See, that's deep. <laughs> if you miss that one, you can't call yourself a theologian. The Bible tells us, the angel said, Mary, don't be afraid. Because what he said and what she thought was going on created fear in her heart. She can, listen, the message of this story is that you can't receive the word of God and the blessing God has for you with fear in your heart. As long as there's fear in your heart, your heart is closed up and you're not going to... You may be hearing things, but you're not hearing things. 
They're not normal. You're confused. You're thinking about all the stuff the way it should be and what shouldn't be done. But there's fear in your heart. Matter of fact, for the sake of time, you need to understand Mary had fear in her heart. Joseph had fear in his heart. The shepherd had fear in her heart. And as long as the world is fearful of our God, they won't hear the love God has for them. The wise men had no fear. The wise men had no fear. And why was that? They were following after his hymn. Why was that? I love comments, by the way. Bring them on. And we're going to get into that in the book of Matthew, why they had no fear. But I'm going to jump in because he said something that's so good. The wise men weren't under the law. The Bible says if you're under the law, you're blinded from the truth. That's what the Bible says. I got scripture for that. I got a whole chapter. Just not the wise men. How about the giants in the, in the promised land? When the Jews went in to spy out the land. You know the story? Yeah. Were they scared of the God of Israel? Absolutely. But was Israel scared? No. What, were, what had they just been put under? Mount Sinai, they got the law. The law showed them what was wrong with them instead of what was right with God. The, how come everywhere in Scripture, people that weren't under the law... Well, who was the only person that came back out of the ten lepers? Who was the only person that came and thanked Jesus? A Samaritan. It was a Gentile. Yeah. The Jews never came back and said thank you. They were cleansed, but they were never healed. There's a difference. Yeah. Cleansing is of the law, and healing is of the heart. Yeah. Oh, good statement. I love it. Yeah. Let's go on. Then, it, then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found what? Favor with God. Yes. What was the message from heaven that took, what was able, what was the word of God that was able to take the fear and bring peace? What's the absence of fear? Peace. Faith is not the absence of fear, people. I'm sorry, whoever said that. Peace is the absence of fear. So what caused, when fear came, what was the message? Oh, what's, what's it say here? You have found what? So while she had fear in her heart, the angel says, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor. Does anybody know what the, def, the, the elementary definition of grace is? Unmerited favor. Here's a grace message. What has she done? What has she done to deserve this blessing? Nothing. That's why they call it grace. Because God's grace is sufficient for you. Oh, don't even get me started on that. And behold, now, he, what's he say again? And behold, you will receive uh, in your womb and bring forth the son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Man, listen to this. Remember, Mary's a little bitty girl from a little bitty place with a little bitty mindset. Her, most likely, according to the culture, the only vision she had in life was to get married and have a male child. It was every girl's dream to get married and have a male child. Little bitty place, little bitty girl with a little bitty vision. That's not what she's hearing from God. Listen to this. Verse 33, and he'll reign over the house of Jacob for it. We don't have time to get into all this. In his kingdom, there will be no what? End. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I have not known a man? See, that's why God wanted her. She didn't have any idea how it was going to work out. The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. Uh, therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth. Oh, this is so good. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has conceived another miracle conception. She was too old, way past the age of conception. The birth wasn't a miracle, John the Baptist, but the conception was. What was conceived in Elizabeth? Say the word. The word told her she was going. So the word manifested. What was conceived in Mary? Say the word. Literally the word of God. Jesus is the word made flesh. 
See, the miracle isn't you doing what God's called you to do. The miracle starts with it being conceived on the inside of you. See, once that word hits your heart and you receive it, look what she says here. And it goes on and says, she has conceived in her old age and, and this is now the sixth month of, of her who was called barren. For with God, nothing is impossible. Then Mary said, oh, this is so good. For Mary said, behold, the maid servant of the Lord. Here it is. Let it be to me according to your word. That is, people, the way we should be with God's word when it's spoken to our hearts. The two greatest confessions. Have you ever heard of the confession message? I hear people all the time out there poo-pooing the confession message. Well, for mainly because people have used it for selfish gratification. The two, but you couldn't even get saved without the confession message. <laughs> you have to what? You have to confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And what? Believe in your heart. For with the heart, one believes unto what? Righteousness. Righteousness. And confession is made unto what? Salvation. salvation. So there's two different things. There's, there's righteousness and there's salvation. They're not the same. They go together, but they're not the same. So what we need to understand here is the two greatest confessions. And if you're not writing something down, you need to write this down. The two greatest confessions you can make for your entire life is number one, Jesus is Lord. Number two, be it unto me according to your word. Whatever your word says about me, I receive it. If your word says that I'm, I'm holy because you're holy, if, if your word says that I'm born from above, I receive that. If your word says I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me, I receive that. See, most people live in their past, don't they? The problem is you don't go back far enough. Yes. He's already written in a book everything that we're supposed to do. So if we agree with that, then it can come to pass. See, it, it is it's such a good thing when, when you agree with God's word. See, when it says, uh, well, two more agree upon my, uh, on, in my word it will be done. It doesn't mean agree that it has to be, you're making agreement with what God has said, not what you want to happen. It's what God says is going to happen. When you fall in line with God's word, ask whatever you will, it's going to be done according to his word, not according to your wishes and dreams. That's why you have to understand God's purpose for your life. God works out all things to, uh, for good, the, the love him and call according to his what? Purpose. Okay, let's do this real quick. So what we need to understand, this is a process of, of the way the Holy Spirit works in our life today. First of all, he has to remove the fear in our hearts so we can see, receive what the word of God says. We talked about it earlier. What did Jesus say man was going to live by? The stones or the bread? No, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, the first temptation of Jesus. What had he just heard right before his temptation? He heard God say, this is my beloved son. When you hear, see, most Christians are trying to become something they already are. You're already loved by God. You're already a child by God. You're already a victor according to God. You're already an overcomer because of God. According to his word, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, it dwells in you. And that same spirit cries out what? Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Not Abba, God, but Abba, Father. See, Jesus didn't come to this world to introduce people to God. He came to introduce them to the Father. Yes. Our Father who art in heaven. Not his. Yes, it was his, but he didn't say, My Father who art in heaven, may thee. No, our Father. Now, I love what it's. Let me just talk about that for a second. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed. You know what the word hallowed means? Holy is thy name. We can sit up here and we can teach you about Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Mekedesh, Jehovah Sidkenu. You've ever heard these names before? These are the names of God in the Old Covenant. But we miss it. When we know all that stuff, we miss it. 
What did Jesus say? The Old Testament didn't call God Father. They called God God and they were scared of him. You realize they weren't scared of the devil in the Old Covenant? They were scared of God. Yeah. It wasn't the devil that opened up the ground and swallowed 30. You know, three, how many people died the first day the law showed up out of the mountain? 3,000. 3, how many people died? I mean, how many people was brought back to the church the first day the Spirit showed up? 3,000. <laughs> because the letter kills and the Spirit gives life. Yeah, that's a nugget. That's a Bible nerd thing. Oh, yeah. They weren't scared of the devil. They were scared of God. So Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. What was his name? Father. Father. We miss it. We go back in the old covenant. Yes, he's all those things. He's my righteousness. My, 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 my shepherd. He's my healer. He's my provider. Yes. But he's my father. Because he is holy. Let me just say it again. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is that name. Don't go right past it. That's the name. All right. I'm sorry. I'm meddling. So we're getting back into Luke chapter 1. And the angel shares about Elizabeth having a miracle conception. Mary has a miracle conception. And what does Mary do immediately after receiving her conception? She runs. Yeah. And you can read it in there. I mean, it doesn't say she runs, but it says she, with haste, fled. She left her family that she was with and went to Elizabeth. Someone that was six months ahead of her in the same type of miracle conception. And she couldn't have gone along. What? what? She couldn't have gone along. A 15 year old girl would never travel 80 miles alone. Well, okay, that's not the point. So, what we need to get here to is that <laughs> what we need to understand is that the Word of God is telling us here what do you need to do? Listen, when you get the Word of God in your heart, if you stick around what is normal, they're going to abort it. If you hang around, what was normal to happen to a 13, 15, 14-year-old girl that was pregnant out of wedlock? What was normal for the law? Can you say stone her to death? That's what was normal. So what happens to you when you hang around family that does not have the same faith that you have, has not heard the word of God that you heard, and they, and the, they still have... You, you go, oh, I'm praying that my... They're going to stone you to death. So she had to go hang around somebody that had a like vision and like mindset that was six months ahead of her. See, you need to find some. Listen, if you're sick and you're, if the Word of God says you're going to be well, you better go hang around someone that's already been healed by the Word of God or the people around you are going to say, oh, that's not for today. They're going to kill it. You have to hang around people. You, the people that you have a relationship will determine whether you fulfill, bring to pass the word that's in your heart in due season. Say due season. Due We're not even going to get into that because this, when you start bringing about due season, the seeds being planted, you understand there's a conception, there's a gestation, and then there's a Earth. manifestation. You've got to use the Asian on the back to make it sound good. Okay? <laughs> Or a delivery. In, in the pregnant world, you have a conception, a gestation, and a due date or delivery. It comes to pass. There's a manifestation of what happened in the miracle. So if you hang around people that don't have that faith you do, you might just abort God's word. And you may have in the past. We need to hang around the people of like faith. Let's see what happened here. Jump over here real quick. Verse 39, Mary arose in those days and went into the hill city which with haste in the city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped 
in her womb. And Elizabeth was what? Filled with the Spirit. See, this just didn't happen in the book of Acts chapter 2. That was a corporate thing, but there were people that had been filled with the Spirit in times past individually. Let's see the manifestations. Now, this is similarly God church here. And so sometimes I have to clarify that this is still for today. Most of some of the God churches understand the gifts of the Spirit are still for today. Okay. Uh, and he goes, says, then it says, the, it filled with the Spirit. Then, then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. Who told her that? Spirit. It was a word of knowledge. She was filled with the Spirit and she instantly had a word of knowledge. Mary wasn't showing nothing. Mary didn't tell her nothing. It's when she heard the sound of her voice. Oh, Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit and a word of knowledge came forth. Right there. It says, blessed are you among women and blessed is the... How'd she know she was pregnant? Holy Spirit just told her. Had a word of knowledge. Seeing, having information that was never told to somebody about somebody is a word of knowledge. For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded into my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who, what? Say that word. Believe. Believe. What if she wouldn't have believed? What is the blessing of believing? Let's read it. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of, of those things which were told to her from the Lord. How did she know that the Lord even spoke to her? Unless the Holy Spirit spoke it to her, being filled with the Spirit. Wow. This is way before the book of Acts. Yeah. What if she wouldn't have believed? You didn't miss verse 43, that she knew that it was the mother of the Lord. Oh. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? How did she know it was the Lord inside her womb? Unless the Holy Spirit told her. How many people filled with the Spirit? You need to be sensitive. The Holy Spirit could be speaking to you about somebody or something in your life that you need to know. See, what happened here, Mary motivated Elizabeth. Oh, yeah. And Elizabeth motivated yeah. Mary. Yeah. They walked together. They walked together. I believe with all my heart, if Mary wouldn't have believed, there would have been a virgin chain. If she would not have received, if she would have kept fear in her heart, and not receive them. If she would never have said, be it unto me, God wouldn't have made her do it. You have to be willing. Is it God's will for all men to be saved? Yes. yes. Are all men going to get saved? No. Why not? Yeah. 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 Is it God's will for all men to be healed? Yes. Are all men going to get healed? No. Just saying. We could talk about this all day. We do not have time for your sake. I do. I don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> you do. We have to get out of here before tomorrow morning, I'm sure. <laughs> Let's turn over real quick. You have to trust me. We, we, we do this. All. Let's go over to Luke chapter 2. And it came to pass, verse 1, and it came to pass in, that, uh, in those days that a decree went out from Ces uh, Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while... Quirinius. Thank you. Notice how I paused and let my <laughs> good... Per, yeah, educated one over there say stuff. Was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth in Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. That's called the house of bread. You probably already know that, right? Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed. Now, there's so much misunderstanding about this whole story. First of all, let me, no, not first of all, let me just read this, gosh. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with 
child. Now, see, we read right past that, but you don't understand the culture. You're taking it out of context. You're looking at the greeting card. You've heard a story, and you don't hear the story again until next year. The best way, there is a, a Hebrew word, and I can't say it with my limited Texas vocabulary lips. They don't work that way. But the best way I can explain this word that is a Hebrew word or the concept in Hebrew, I have to go back to the Amish community. Everybody understands Amish? If someone has created a great sin in the Amish community, they are what? Kicked out. Shunned. Well, thank you. Shunned. You're not technical. They're not kicked out. They're shunned. <laughs> The same things happened here. There was no room for her and them in the end because they had been shunned. You need to understand there's two words. The two words are Tame and Tehor. Now in America, if I said Tame because of our soap, you'd think, oh, that's real clean. No, in Hebrew, Tame is unclean and Tehor is clean. See, we think Tehor is the ugly word because of yeah. the last part of that. Or... Tehor is, means you're clean. Tame means you're unclean. In other words, when the woman with the issue of the blood was inside the crowd, she was, or when a leper approaches a crowd, they're supposed to say, Tame, Tame. As they, so people have opportunity to move out of the way so they're not touched. We learned that two years ago at COVID. <laughs> How long have you become these Bibles? <laughs> so, yeah, COVID. So, so they were Tame. They had been exiled. They had been shunned. And see, when, when a person that is Tame, if a person is Tehor and touches someone that is Tame, guess what happens? The person that, the person that is Tehor becomes Tame. So no one wanted to be around them. No, when the person's Tehor touches someone that's Tame, the Tehor becomes unclean. Yep. They become Tame. Okay? And in Jewish culture, there's multiples of this. Why, you, if you go into a room where someone is dead, where there's a dead body, you become Tame. Huh. Jesus went into Lazarus' tomb when he was what? We do it, that's a rabbit trail, sorry. Can't go there. We call them up. Yeah, so so what, we need to understand... Of what this means. So there was a couple reasons why there was no room for them in the, yeah. the end. Number one, they were tame. They were unclean. And if anybody touched them or put them, if they would have went into the house, they would have made the house tame. Because they were shunned. They were unclean. Second, she was about ready to give birth. She wasn't giving birth that night. I don't care what it says. How they, oh, Jesus. Oh, hurry, Johnson. It's coming. It's coming. Oh, that's... Oh! No. Can we just read scripture? I'm sorry. This is why I don't... Want that. Anyway, Sunday morning is not for me, okay? Look what it says here. What verse did I leave off on? 26. 2-6. Uh, Let me read verse 5. To be registered with Mary, uh, his betrothed, a wife who was with child. Yep. So it was that while they were there, does that sound like they got there that night? Okay. The days, say days, days. plural, were completed for her to be delivered. So they didn't get there the night of delivery, people. It doesn't sound as good as the Christmas card, but you know, hey... Do you realize the shepherds never saw a star? But you think they did because it's Hallmark put it there above the manger. Yeah, they did. Okay. Oh, they had to hurry up so they, did, so they got there before the wise men, you know. Yeah, that hey, came later. Yeah. Don't forget to use the two words for in. I will, honey. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the yeah. inn. Now what we need to understand is first of all they had the right to be basically almost in any house there because they were of the lineage of David. 
It was their heritage. They couldn't go in because, number one, they were Tame. Number two, they're about ready to give birth. And if you know anything about Jewish culture, any type of bloodletting makes a person unclean. And so they were pregnant, and there was... So she, she was couldn't pregnant go... pregnant outside of marriage. Pregnant, yeah, they're pregnant outside of marriage. That's what made them Tame. Now... There's two stories I want you to understand in Scripture. One is this one, where there's no room for them in the inn. And there's another reference to the word inn in Luke chapter 10, talking about the, the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan came and, uh, you know the story, and took him and gave him to the innkeeper. The what? Innkeeper. And put him in an inn. There's two different words. That inn that the innkeeper had in Luke chapter 10 is a different inn then there was no room for them in the the inn. This word inn is the, the Greek word kataluma. Okay? It means guest room. It literally means, how many people have a house that, let me put it this way, have you ever heard of a mother-in-law apartment? <laughs> it's usually above the garage and beside the garbage. In the no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. You know, just kidding. No, you, you got a special room that you put guests in when they come? Yeah. That's a Cataluma. It's done up real nice. You're treating your guests special. Look the word up. This word in, in any concordance, is the word Cataluma. The word in Luke chapter 10 where the, the Good Samaritan turned the person that was that he poured an oil on, that's that's like a hotel. So this is why they could not come in. See, they were family. And family couldn't receive them, number one, because they were Tame, number two, because they were about ready to give birth. And if they would have gave birth in that house, the house would have been Tame, making everybody else Tame. Yes? Isn't another miracle that the census was decreed and God set it up. So I tell you, when you, when you look at all the, nothing takes God by surprise. Matter of fact, the, I don't know if you want to call these miracles because it's just God's plan, but even the stars in heaven declared this. It just wasn't the census. It just wasn't all these other things that lined up. It's just not all the prophetic word. See, the Jews, what, do you realize they knew the prophetic scriptures? You understand that? They knew them. We think we do, but they knew them. They knew this stuff. They knew the Messiah was going to be born now. We're going to get into that when we get into the shepherds. You ever heard that the shepherds were the lowliest of the low? Stop it. What's that Latin word? Bullimus craptimus. That is so wrong. So wrong. They weren't. See, that's see. We've assimilated scripture in the way we think, and it's wrong. We'll get into that. Now you can find out all this information if you look into the the Talmud, the Mishnah, the other Jewish writings that have. We just have glimpses of their ceremonies and their culture, and they have volumes of their ceremonies and culture that line up with scripture. It just adds to it. Do you understand that? Naturally, they would have more than we would, right? Right? Okay. The Talmud, it, well, we want to get to the... I wonder where you were at. Where's your better hand? Good nap. Uh, Good <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can see he's still... He's, yeah, well, I can't get into that. I don't have time. Let's go. Where was I at now? Um, oh, up to verse 7. And she brought forth the firstborn, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. Uh, we, we're talking about the Cataluma. Now, what we need to understand here, we're going to talk about the word manger when we talk about the shepherds in just a second. You need to realize that there's a phrase here I want you to understand, in, and you can look this up. Th laid him in, this says, a uh, manger. Giving you the idea, or giving general people the idea, that it's just any... Can, can you see... Hey, open up. You got a baby being born in your manger? No? Okay. Next house. Hey! When the shepherds went looking... No. They knew the manger he was in. Because the word... The, the proper translation for where it says a manger is the... Should be uh, 
translated the manger. It's a definite article like the law, just not a law, but the law. It's a definite article in Greek. There was the manger. There was only one the manger in all the area. Matter of fact, there was only one the manger in all of Israel. And we're going to get into that. So these are signs. These are hints. These are clues to help us understand really what took place in this period of time. Swad you're finding babes in what? Swaddling cloth. Wow. And she brought him his firstborn and wrapped him in what? Swaddling cloth. That's a key. Laid him in the manger because there is no room for him in the Cataluma. Wow. Verse 8. You ready for the ride? Now, they were in the same country. Now, that's what's really interesting about country. Do you have the map? Can you put the map up? Yeah. The word country. If I ask you what country are we from what are you going to say the united, united states of america that's our country but that's not what this is saying now if you live out in the if you don't live in the city limits you live in the boonies, boonies. you live in the country the definition for the word country in greek is literally means between limits between what limits city limits so the area between the city limits. So no, it's outside a city, and before you get to another city, it's called what? Country. In the book of Leviticus, and in the, the Mishnah, it literally tells the Jews that the sheep that are going to be sacrificed at the altar have to be born within six miles of the temple. Okay, they have to understand that Jebus is Jerusalem. See the word Jerusalem out here? There's, there's, your, there's Bethlehem down here. There's a six mile, that's a six mile difference between where, where she says Jebus is, it says Jerusalem right there, and Bethlehem, that's six miles. And you see Rachel's tomb is in between there. That's real important for you to see as we get into this. So it says here, in the same country. So in the area between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And I, I, like I said, we've so many of us have heard that they were the lowliest of the low. They couldn't do anything else. No, this is what was called Levitical shepherds. Does everybody understand what the word Levitical means? Levitical means they were the tribe of Levi, the tribe the priests come from. See, the, what we need to understand, Levi started the process, then Aaron, then Zadok, and the reason it started branching off, because as you begin to have children and more children, there's not everybody qualified. If you could be of the tribe of Levi, you didn't qualify to be a priest. You realize that? Because after a while, you had to be of Aaron and then Zadok. And, and if you weren't, didn't qualify to be a priest, you realize, <laughs> to show you how culture is so important, when, when Peter took the sword and cut... Uh, Malchus is, you know who Malchus is? Malchus is the guy who, in the garden when Jesus was in there praying, they came to get him, and he's, they said, he, he tried to cut his head off. No, he didn't. He's not that stupid. Thou shalt not kill. He wasn't trying to kill nobody. But he cut his ear off. Why would he cut his ear off? Because the ear had a sign of a servant in it. No. Deface him. Deface him. Because in the book of Leviticus says you could only be a priest if you didn't have the flaw on your face. You had to be flawless. One arm couldn't be longer than the other. You couldn't have a mole where someone could see it. So there were other jobs that people under the, in the tribe of Levi had to do. One of those jobs was being the shepherd. Of what? Just any sheep? No. Of the sheep that was going to be sacrificed for the altar. Now this is where we need to expand your little horizons. Okay? Because we can take you to scripture to show you in scripture where it says in the book of Numbers that you have to have, the Jews had to have two sacrifices of a perfect male lamb every day. One in the morning and one in the evening. It's called a continual sacrifice. 
their days, a prophetic year, is 360 days. So for 360 days, they had to have two perfect male lambs less than a year old. Can anybody do any quick math for me? What is 360 <coughs> divided, uh, or times two? 720. 720 perfect male lambs under a year old had to be provided for just the everyday sacrifices in the temple. These Levitical shepherds were the best, highest quality trained sh shepherds that could be, could live. They knew the, they knew exactly what to look for. They knew exactly how to raise them. They knew exactly how to take care of them. Did you ever think there had to be 720 sacrifices a year of perfect, unblemished male lambs under a year old? That's not including the ceremonial sheep. That's not including the perfect lambs when people would come in with their sheep and they got scarred along the way. They had to trade them in. It's like a car lot. It's not including the bulls and the goats. Well, yeah, we're just talking about the lambs. And so they would have to trade them in because they could only sacrifice perfect lambs. And so they would have to pay money. Here's mine, but take, you know, even up. And so they'd have to buy a perfect lamb. So how many thousands in between in the country between Jerusalem and the house of bread. These were Levitical shepherds. Now, these sheep were born in a place called a Migdal Adair. Have you ever heard that? Now, we have time to go back into Scripture if you want to, which we probably will. Let's turn to Micah. Micah chapter 5. It says this. Micah chapter 5. Verse 2, but you, Bethlehem, Euphrates, though you are little among thousands of, of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from the old, from everlasting. In other words, from the beginning to the end. This is, Now, the Targums, remember I mentioned the Targums? Yeah. Here's a Targum. It says this. But you, Bethlehem, afraid as though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth, this is the word Targum, from you shall come forth before me, the Messiah. That's what they read. That's in their Bible. That's the Aramaic version of Holy Scripture. It makes it plain and clear. They knew out of Bethlehem was going to come the Messiah. And being Levitical shepherds, they knew this, along with everybody else. They were looking for the Messiah. Look over at chapter 4, verse 8. Verse 7. It says this. Well, I'll start with verse 8. And you, O tower of the flock. Do you see that? Is anybody looking up in the Strong's to check me out as I say this? The word tower is Migdal. Flock is Eder. And you, O tower of the flock, are you, O tower of the Migdal Adair? The stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. What is it? The Messiah. So it's identifying that out of the McDowell are the tower of the flock. I hope someone's looking it up, checking me out. But it says McDowell Adair. Now we can go further back. We can go in different places in Scripture to see where tower of the flocks is mentioned. Further back. Matter of fact, you'll see that. Does everybody know the story of Rachel in Genesis chapter? What is it? Let's see if I can find it real quick. Genesis chapter 35. Verse 16. Now we're going to show you how this fits into the rest of Scripture. This just isn't a, a, something that just happened. God just like had the census to be taken to get them to the town. Listen to this. If you think that's a miracle, the census, listen to this one. Verse 16. Then 
Then they journeyed from Bethel. Where's the map? Put the map back on there. This is the map that we're... There's Bethel. And they were journeying to Bethlehem. And as they went through Bethel, they went through Jerusalem. After they passed through Jerusalem, they're in that section called country. Matter of fact, that's the same country in which David watched his father's sheep. The same acreage. It's all the same place. So as they were heading toward Bethlehem, they passed. Watch this, okay? Once you see the map, it says, they journeyed from Bethel and uh, were there was, uh, and when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem, Rachel labored in childbirth and she had hard labor. Does anybody know what Rachel's name means? Yeah. Besides joy and grace? It's a you. Not you, but a female sheep. E-W-E. It means a female sheep. Look at the symbolism here, people. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, do not fear. Uh-oh, there's some more fear. You will have this son also. They knew it was a son. And so it was as, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni. But his father called him Benjamin. Now, Benoni means son of my sorrows. Benjamin means at my right hand. Now, why is that important? Because Jesus is the son of God's sorrows and now sits at his right hand. See all the connections here? Why do I say the son of his sorrows? What, did, what was ripped at his crucifixion from top to bottom? The veil of the temple. Why was it from top to bottom? Because the book of Deuteronomy it says that when a, when a father loses his firstborn in anguish, he rips his outer garment from top to bottom. In anguish, in sorrow. Oh, yeah. We don't get in. I mean, it, it ties into everything. It goes on and says this. Verse 19. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath. That is what? Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave. Jesus. To this day, and you can go to Jerusalem, and, and there's a place called Rachel's tomb. Right outside, north of Bethlehem. In between Jerusalem and north of Bethlehem. In the country. Yeah. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder, the tower of Adar. The Migdal, remember tower means Migdal, Migdal means tower. So this is the place. This is not it. Go back to that picture. This is a picture of what a, a, a Migdal Adar looked like, but this is not it. You understand that? Mm -hmm. It has been torn down. But just outside of, you know, the, you ever been to Israel and there's called the, the, the field of the shepherds? The tower of the flock. The Magdala Dare was in the field of the shepherds. Watch this. There's something you need to understand. Let's go. Oh, here's what the Targum says. In verse 21. Then, then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Edar. This is what the Targum says. The place from whence it's to be the King Messiah will be revealed at the end of days. Mm -hmm. This is what they would have read. This is what they would have known. They would have known that the Messiah was going to come out of the Magdala Dare. Why the Magdala Dare? This is the place where all the Passover lambs were provided for the temple. Wrapped in what kind of cloths? The, Jesus was wrapped in what? Don't say clothes. Swaddling. You ever look up what swaddling was? Does anybody know what swaddling cloth are? Yeah. What are they? Wrapped around the little legs of lambs to keep them safe. Where'd they come from? The, to, what, 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 to keep them what? Keep them safe. Keep them safe from scarring themselves mm -hmm. at birth. The, the, the swaddling cloths, you know, this is where they came from. When the priests were done with their garments in the temple and they were damaged in some way or whatever. You know, it's a bloody thing that they were part of. When they were not used anymore, usable, they would take their garments and rip them in strips. 
and all the strips of garments that the priest used in the temple, that the priest wore in the temple, were wrapped on the Passover lambs. It was called swaddling cloth. The only place these strips were taken was the Magdala Dare right outside of Bethlehem where they raised the Passover lambs. So the very clothes, the first garments, the first cloth that Jesus was wrapped in was the same garments the priest wore in the temple. <laughs> yeah, I, I got one grunt. I know there should be more than one grunt out there. I don't look for amens, I look for grunts. Okay. She has a question. Yes. Where did they get them? Where did Joseph and Mary get the swaddling cloth? They were at the Magdala Dare. There was no room for them in the inn. There were no there room for the inn. That's a good there. question. They went to the place that they could give birth that was already Tame to give birth. They were at the and evening. while they were there, they wrapped the babe in swaddling cloth. Now, who was there to witness this? The shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And what happened, which we hadn't got there yet? Let's just read this. I'm sorry, I should read more scripture. And verse 9 in Luke chapter 2. And behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Why were they afraid? Listen. For 400 silent years. Look in your Bibles. Some Bibles have it, some don't. There's one page that has 400 silent years on it. That's how long no prophet spoke. God didn't speak to Israel for 400 years. And the first words that came out of the, from heaven was peace on earth and goodwill. Because they were afraid. When God spoke, people died in the Old Testament. Come on, people. Like I said, they weren't scared of the devil. They were scared of God. Yeah. And what's the church tell the world? To be scared of God. Yeah. As long as they're scared of God, they're never going to hear the word of God. Yeah. Oh. oh, wow. Okay, verse maybe, 10. Maybe that's our problem. It's called the gospel of peace. The angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you what? Judgment and wrath and condemnation. Good tidings a great joy. Which will be to all people. Say all people. all people. For there is born to you in this day. Say this day. That's powerful. This is the day prophecy was fulfilled, people. This is the day the shepherds knew the Messiah was coming. This is that day. They were anticipating the Messiah coming. And this is that day. Just like they anticipated the Messiah coming in in Luke chapter 19. They knew what Daniel said in his scriptures. That the Messiah would come in to that, on that day they knew. They knew exactly that day the Messiah was going to come into the Jerusalem. And would die not for his own benefit but for those of the others. Jesus even said it this way on Luke chapter 19. That he wept, he wept over Jerusalem because they didn't know what made for their peace. Especially for them on this, their day. It was a certain day. And they knew it. For there is born to you this day in the city of what? David, David a Savior, the Messiah. Who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a what? A sign. What's a sign? Something you see. It's not a star. This will be a sign to you. You'll find the babe wrapped in. There's only one place. There's swaddling cloth, people. <laughs> Everybody didn't have swaddling cloth in their mangers in the back barn on their back 40. In a cave. Only one place in the world. You can find swaddling cloth in the Magdala there next to Rachel's tomb just outside of Bethlehem. Lying in the manger just like it said the inn. The manger. It's one place. There's only one place 
where the manger is at. It's the manger where all the other perfect lambs are born that are going to be sacrificed to fulfill the law. See, when Jesus said he came to fulfill the law, he, he fulfilled, fulfilled the law. Yeah. even the sacrificial law. He was wrapped in swaddling yeah. cloth. And checked out by the Levitical shepherds. And the Levitical shepherds knew exactly what to look for for a perfect lamb to be slain. How do we know this? Listen to the shepherds. And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. Do you think that's a different covenant than the one they were just coming out of? Yes! They weren't used to that. But because fear had been taken care of, so it was when the angels, I mean, we get to, listen, I know we love the song. It's probably... 90% of the people in here's favorite song. I'm not going to tell you to shut up. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you never to sing it again. But it's not right. Because the traditions of men make the word of God of no effect. Anybody can tell me what that song is without Joyce pounding it off? Silent Holy Night No, it wasn't it was anything but silent. And suddenly, <laughs> there's with an angel a multitude, say multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God. <laughs> What's it quiet? And saying, glory to God in the highest. And I have peace and God well. Shh, we're Baptists. We can't be loud in church. We got to be reverent. Oh, bullimus, scraptimus. The church has been too quiet for too long. It's time the church unsile in our night and be like the angels and shout glory. He's come. He's risen. He's here. The church is too quiet. That's why we got America the way it is. Because we've been too reverent. So it was when the angels had gone from them into heaven. And don't even get me started talking about the gospel of peace. We don't have time for that. You ever heard the gospel of peace, the message? No, you haven't. Because it doesn't get taught. Joy, we're going to do one verse. I know. That's Isaiah a big rabbit trail. Rabbit trail, Isaiah 54. Let me show you the beginning of the gospel of peace. The, the, you know what gospel means, good news? What's the good news of peace? It comes from a covenant. Say covenant. covenant. Isaiah 54, verse 9. I, I'm not, I don't have to, but I'm going to. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For this is like the waters of Noah to me, for I, as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so I have sworn. So the same as God covered the earth with water. Did he swear to Noah he would never do it again? Yes. Has he ever done it again? No. Why? Because he swore. So whatever he's about to say is just like, this is deep theological truth, people. Isaiah 54 comes after Isaiah 53. That's deep. Do you know what Isaiah 53 is all about? The Messiah, Jesus, and his crucifixion. So this is dealing with the time period after his resurrection. Can you say that's us? Come on, can you say that's us? So Isaiah 54 is about our time period. For this is like the waters of Noah to me, for I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so I have sworn... That I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. Uh oh, there goes a lot of prophets. Kick them out. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from you. Nor shall my covenant of peace 
be removed. God swore. So why aren't we hearing this? Because it doesn't fit our traditions in our religion. Because Jesus said the traditions of men will make the word of God of what? No. Next verse. Oh, back. We're still doing this one. No, we don't have time. I'm sorry. Okay. We could meddle. Yeah, let's go back to the angels. Let's go back to the angels, Luke. We got to get into the wise men for some in the back. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph in the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely what? No. They made what? Widely no. known. Can't you see him sneaking out of town? In the dark? Not waking nobody up? No. They knocked on all the doors. They knocked on every door. They made widely known. These are the Levitical shepherds that knew the Messiah was coming and he had come. The angels just told them that the Messiah was here. So they woke up everybody in town. It wasn't a silent night. Give me some kind of religious break. Then they had seen him. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the sayings. What sayings? Which was told to them. What were they told by the angels to everybody in town? The Messiah's here. That was the message. Do you think the town was excited? Yes. Do you think they said, well, next year we'll celebrate differently. <laughs> we'll put up two trees. And all those who heard it marveled. That sounds like a silent night, doesn't it? At those things which were told to them by the shepherds. So the angels told the shepherds. The shepherds told the people. And we get into what is called a... Verse 20. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God. You see, they were quiet. Shh. We can't lift our hands. We can't dance. But we're going to give glory to God as we sneak out of town. <laughs> Welcome to church. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. I love this next part. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 6. Now we're going to get into Matthew, but we're going to turn to Isaiah 60, verse 6. If you have your scriptures, turn there. If you don't, just look up on the board. Isaiah 60, verse 6. Actually, we're going to start at verse 1. Let's just see if this sounds almost like a Christmas story. Everybody, arise, sign. Mm -hmm. For the light has come. Yeah. For the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Look at verse 3. The Gentiles, say Gentiles. Gentiles. That's you. The Gentiles shall come to the light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Look at verse 6. The multitude of camels shall cover your land. Have you ever heard of the three wise men? What's that Latin word? Bulimus or Aptimus? It is so far. Listen to the grandeur. Listen to the... listen. We make it look like a little tiny thing that happened. No, the world was waiting for Jesus, the Messiah, to show up. Yeah. All prophetic scripture was hinged on this event. So he could be crucified and risen from the grave. 
so he can be seated at the right hand of the Father. Come on, church. So he can come back real soon. The multitude of camels shall cover your land, the dromedaries of Median and Ephrath. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. Does that sound like the wise men coming from Babylon? Say yes! <laughs> How many camels? Enough to cover their land. Do you think Herod was disturbed and troubled by three wise men on three little camels? And maybe a donkey? Do you think the whole city was moved because of three wise men and three camels and three little donkeys? No! But when you had a caravan coming from Babylon with so many camels, it covered their land. What you're going to hear tonight, you've never heard anywhere else. Because we have a document from the archives of Babylon. You can get this document. I'm not going to charge you $1,000 to touch it. I can show you the book it's in. Now, I can't read Aramaic, but there's people that can. And they've translated the document of the wise men's return, their report to their king of their journey. We have it in letter form. Have you ever heard it? You will tonight. Of what they experienced on their journey. See, wise men doesn't mean magic man. It doesn't mean just, a, where did the wise men come from? Well, we know Babylon, but stop and think about it. You know what, what started all this? Not, not just Genesis chapter three, but Daniel chapter one. Who was taken? Listen, King Nebuchadnezzar took, defeated it. God gave a pagan king Israel. And he took all the good stuff out of Jerusalem and Israel and took it back to Babylon. Along that was Shadrach, Meshach, Shach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and a bunch. Every good looking male, every good looking woman, if you didn't have a fly, if you were if you were maimed, crippled, or had no value, you got left behind in Jerusalem. Everything else was taken. And for 400 years, and you know the story in Daniel chapter 4? Oh, goodness gracious. Does everybody know that? Do I have to read it? In Daniel chapter 4, who was put in charge? Who was put in charge of all of the wise men? Daniel was. I'm sorry. Maybe it was Daniel. Daniel chapter 2. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts. And he made him, listen. What verse? 8, 48. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts. And he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. And chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. And what did Daniel know? His prophecies. He taught them the word of God. He taught them that the king was coming. He taught them everything that the Jews knew, but they weren't listening to it. They weren't seeing it because they were under the law. They were looking for the Messiah. They could see the stars in the sky and said, look, there it is. In Matthew, so I mean, I believe with all my heart the moment Mary said, be it unto me, I believe the process of the camels getting up started. Even though it was a year and a half later, I believe that process, I believe the wise men started seeing something. They started reading this in scripture and the revelation became, they began to get prepared for the coming of the Messiah. They could see it in the stars in the heavens. The scripture literally says, while they were in the east, they saw the star. The star wasn't in the east. They were in the east and saw the star in the west. Does everybody know where Babylon is? Due east of Jerusalem. Almost on a parallel. They were in the east. While we, were in, we saw the star in the east. No, the star was in the west. They were in the east and saw, while they were in the east, they saw the star. Where was the star? Over Bethlehem. Chapter one, I mean chapter two, verse one in Matthew. 
Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in all the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to what? Where did all the Jews go in the book of Daniel? They went to Babylon. Do you think there was Jews that were believers? Do you think there was Babylonians that were believers? Absolutely, because Daniel was in charge of all their knowledge and information. How do you change a nation? You get into the educational system. These wise men were worshipers of Jehovah, Yahweh, the God of Daniel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were believers. They weren't pagan. They came to what? Worship. Worship. They didn't bring a little bit of gold, a little bit of frankincense, and a little bit of myrrh. It was a caravan. Now, for the sake of time, I know it's late, but you got to forgive me. No, you don't. You can always get up and leave if you don't find it interesting. It says here that Herod was troubled and all of Jerusalem was what? Troubled. The good question that was asked or statement was, why didn't Jerusalem see this? Why didn't the Israel see the star? They did, but they didn't understand it. They saw the star and understood it because they were under the law. They should have been looking and totally aware of what was taking place. This was a year and a half after the birth. Joy, can you read that? Yeah. This is coming. Let me let me get an official here so you don't think we're just... You can go look this up if you want to. If you don't, that's fine. Just doesn't matter. Do you want me to say uh, there, There's a book called The Pre-Flood Origin of Astrology. And this is called The Science of the Magi. It's also mentioned in Africanus Julius Africanus. A, a, a Jewish historian. Okay, you ready? And this is found, no. The uh, uh, Antinician Fathers, Volume 6 of, uh, of Africanus. It even tells you what volume it's in. These are, I got a whole bunch of this stuff where this stuff is mentioned. Um, and I, I, we don't have time to get into the prophecy of the goddess Juno. But it's just, this comes from the Hall of Records, Babylonian Hall of Records. This is an official document in the archives of Babylon. Read it. Okay. Church Father Origen of 185 to 254 is when he was in against Celsus in one. Uh, verse 60 stated that the Magi had a copy of the prophecy of Balaam found in Numbers 24 about the star coming out of Jacob. It was given to them by the great sage Daniel after the time of Cyrus taking the kingdom. Origen also stated in against Celsus in 1 verse 58 that historical records indicated that the Magi were not Chaldeans but Persian. The Magi remarked that a star had just appeared. The advice the Magi had given the king was to send a delegation to Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, to inquire about the new virgin-born Jewish divine king. The king did exactly that. He sent a delegation of Magi, who also means um, administrators, uh, who had studied the Jewish religion and had come to believe in their sacred writings. The rest of what follows in the record is the Magi's own words to what they found. So here it is. So that first part was origin, okay? That the historian. Yeah. So this is the like this is the something. This is the Magi's words. When we came to Jerusalem, the sign of the star, together with our arrival, roused all the people. They said, Why are Persian wise men here? And what is this strange stellar phenomenon? The chief of the Jews interrogated us by asking. For what purpose have you come here? And we said, because he, whom you call the Messiah, has been born. They didn't believe us, but they didn't dare to accuse us of anything. But they said to us, by the justice of heaven, tell us what you know about this matter. 
We answered them, You do not truly believe in him, nor would you believe us if we even swore an oath. You follow your own heedless counsel because the Christ, the Son of the Most High, is born. Now, now, now stop right there for a second. I want you to understand what's happening here. These wise men are representing their king of Babylon. They have, I'll let them tell you what they have with them. But they're now speaking trash to the king of Jerusalem. They're telling him he don't know nothing. Read that again. Listen to that. They did not believe us, but not, did not dare accuse us of anything. But they said to us, by the justice of heaven, tell us what you know about this matter. We answered them, you do not truly believe in him, nor would you believe us, even if we swore an oath. You follow your own heedless counsel, because the Christ, the son of the most high, is born. And he is, See, the, they knew it. And he is the subverter of your law and synagogues. That is why you are acting like you have. You've been stuck with a dart and you are bitter when you hear his name and see- They're talking to a king. And it, when you hear his name and see that we have suddenly come here because we truly do believe. Then they took counsel together and they urged us to accept their gifts and to tell no one that such an event had occurred in their land because it may cause the people to revolt against them. But we replied, we have brought gifts in his honor with the view of proclaiming those mighty things which we have witnessed in our country on occasion of his birth. And you dare to bribe us to conceal the things which the divinity, who is above the heavens, has communicated to us and neglect the commandments of our proper king? And after reconsidering, they gave up the matter. So they stopped right now. They stopped thinking. They just got through saying, hey, you don't believe in that. I mean, calling them out. Now, why would a king put up with that? you got to ask that question. Because the Magi were the group that installed new kingdoms and he was afraid. Listen to the rest. And remember the prophetic word we heard in Isaiah 60, verse 6, about the camels covering their land? Mm -hmm. and, and why the, they were troubled? Go ahead. And when the king of Judea sent for us and put to us certain questions, we acted in the same manner until he was thoroughly enraged at our replies. <laughs> we left him accordingly without giving him any greater heed to him than to any other common person. We came to that place to which we were, to which we were went, sent, and we saw the mother and the child, the star indicating to us the royal babe. And we said to um, the mother, what is your name, O renowned mother? And she said, Mary, sirs. And we said to her, where are you from? And she replied, from this district of the Bethlehemites. Then we said, do you have a husband? And she answered, I was only betrothed when a certain Sabbath dawned at the rising of the sun and an angel appeared to me, bringing me suddenly the glad tidings of a son. And in trouble, I cried out, be it not so to me, Lord, for I have not a husband. And he persuaded me to believe that by the will of God, I should have this son. Then we said to her, mother, mother, all the lords of Persians have called you blessed. You glor your glory is great, for you are exalted above the women of renown, and you are shown to be more queenly than all the queens. The child was sitting on the ground, being, as she said, in his second ear. And having in part the likeness of his mother, she had long hands and a body somewhat delicate, and her color was like that of ripe wheat. And she had a round face, and her hair was bound up. We brought along with us a servant who was a skillful painter, who painted a portrait of them both, which we brought back with us and placed in our temple. It is inscribed to love the son, the mighty God, the King Jesus, the power of Persia dedicated this. And taking up the child, each of us in turn and bearing him in our arms, we saluted him and worshiped him and presented to him gold, myrrh and frankincense, addressing him thus, we gift you with your worm, O Jesus, ruler of heaven. And in no other way would things unordered be ordered. You were not at hand, were you not at hand? In no other way could things heavenly be brought to into conjunction with the things earthly, but by your descent. Such service cannot be discharged. If only the servant is sent us, as when the master himself is present, neither can so much be achieved when the king is there himself. It became the wisdom of your system that you should deal in this manner with men. And the child leaped and laughter acted and acted at our caress words. And when we had bidden the mother farewell and when she had shown us honor 
and we had testified to her the reverence which became us, we came again to that place in which we lodged. That evening there appeared to us one of a terrible and fearful countenance, saying, Get out quickly, lest you be taken in a snare. And we in terror said, Who, divine leader, could plot against a so heavily armed envoy? Hear that? A so heavily, heavily armed, armed envoy. envoy. <clears throat> and he replied, Herod, but get up straight away and depart in safety and peace. So we immediately departed and brought back home this record of what had happened in Jerusalem and of Christ our Savior, who was made both no, made known as both God and man. To him be the glory and the power unto the ages of the ages. Amen. They were believers. Mm -hmm. To me, this tells me that there's a painting yes. somewhere in the archives of Mary and baby Jesus. The reason Herod didn't kill them for talking trash to him like they did, because their army was bigger. <clears throat> That's why the city was troubled. <laughs> we just read past that. The city was troubled. Why were they troubled? There was an army in their land that wasn't theirs. <laughs> You know how many times they've been conquered? <laughs> All we're trying to do tonight is get you to see that it's not a Christmas story. It's fulfillment of prophecy all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. It's a fulfillment. As Paul Harvey says, and the rest is yet to come. Yeah. Resurrection Day is coming. You don't want to hear what we got to say about Resurrection Day in context. We've done it before here, I think, haven't we? Yeah. yeah. When we do it in fullness, it takes five hours. We do this every year in Fergus Falls on a Saturday. It's you're there six hours. We have lunch in the middle, and we have five hours of. Whoa. You'll never look at Palm Sunday again the same. Just to give you a little, little sample. When Jesus said, if, you don't, if my disciples stop, the rocks will cry out. He doesn't say rocks. He says stones. What stones? We think little pebbles. He was in the middle of a graveyard, people. It's called the Mount of Olives. It's nothing but a graveyard. He's talking about gravestones. The saints would come out of the graves and cry out, the king is here. Yeah. Oh yeah. I want to encourage you to unsilent your testimony. Unsilent your gospel. Unsilent your love. Shout in the world the goodness of God. Because it is good news. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give us to gather together in this your place. Holy Spirit, you're the great teacher. We simply ask that you do what you do best. Continue to open the eyes of our understanding. Bring to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of your word. All God's people said, Amen. Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support also helps us to continue to share this message of grace, peace, and Christ's righteousness in the finished work of the cross. You can give online at cokerministries.com or you can mail your support to or prayer requests to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parkers Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed.